Drama, drama, drama. You gotta love some drama in the stock market, folks. We got action, it's earnings season, we got craziness. This is the sort of markets we love. Dow drops 500 points, heads for the worst day in a month. Wow, okay, so we actually got some action. Looking at a heat map here today of the market is definitely Red Dead Redemption out there for many areas, right? Uh, we also have gotten a couple key pieces of data today that are, that are you know, rather troublesome that I want to react to here at the, the start, uh, including iPhone bringing down units significantly, September home sales dropping so significantly. So I just want to talk about those for a moment. Then I want to react to this video. Goldman Sachs is talking about only 3% per year over the next 10 years for the stock market gains. And so I wanted, I thought we'd finally hear from the, the horse's mouth in regards to this and, and kind of share my opinions and perspectives. They're going to react to this one. Fed thinks 50 basis point cut was a mistake. Sees more easing is unlikely. Wow, okay, that should be an interesting one to react to. And then surge in mortgage rates is equivalent of 6% increase in home payment prices. That should be an interesting one to react to. So appreciate y'all joining me on this Red Dead Redemption Day. All I ask from you guys, smash that thumbs up button. And if you want to be subscribed to the channel here, it's absolutely free to do so. We are at a new all-time high. I believe it's 52,300 plus subscribers. So appreciate each and every one of you for the, being here on the channel. And additionally, pin comment down there today is a workshop I made last month for you guys. It's a free workshop. If you want access to it, I can email it over or send it over via text. Stocks to buy now for 2025. You already got to be thinking about 2025 at this point in time. Before you know it, it's going to be Halloween, November. Then you know how November and December fly by with the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas. It goes fast. Right. All right, guys. So let's get in this. I, there's a couple things I want to react to right off the bat here. I thought this was interesting. Apple analyst Co, who's usually pretty good, they're not perfect, but they're pretty dang good about knowing what's going on with iPhone uh, numbers. It says company cut iPhone 16 orders by 10 million units. Apple shares fell about two percent. Uh, yeah, closer to three percent now. On Wednesday, after industry supply chain analyst Ming Chi Ko said the company has cut orders on iPhone 16 by about 10 million units. Ko said most of the cuts affect the regular iPhone 16 instead of the iPhone 16 Pro models, which have a nicer display and better cameras, blah, blah, blah. As a result, iPhone 16 production for the second half of 2024 is now estimated at 84 million units. No, uh, noting that it is down from 88 million units estimated for production. So... The moral of the story is the base level iPhone 16 doesn't sound like it's selling great, right? Don't put too much weight into this, but it doesn't sound like it's selling great. And I'm honestly not really surprised by that one because it just didn't seem like it's really that sort of iPhone that's going to attract the masses. We know that the highest end iPhones are always going to do well. I bought the highest end iPhone, the iPhone 16 Pro Max, right? There's always a certain amount of customers that will buy the, the most expensive, the highest end, the biggest iPhone, right? But when we're talking about you need to you move ten, many tens of millions of units, you need the masses. You need to sell those, those more base level iPhones that are around a $700 price point, $800 price point. And it seems like this iPhone cycle is just not an exciting one uh, for, for that customer base. So maybe the next one is, but unfortunately... This is not it when it comes to, um, you know, this customer base. And the masses, as I keep telling people over and over again, the masses don't care about the AI crap. Everybody was under this assumption like, oh, my gosh, everybody's going to want the Apple intelligence, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, that's like less than 10% of Apple customers care anything about this Apple intelligence or whatever right now, okay? Maybe in five, 10 years, they'll care, but they do not care right now. That is not something that's gonna make somebody say, oh gosh, I gotta go buy the iPhone 16 because it's supposed to have Apple intelligence at some point. No, 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 okay? Now this one here, September home sales dropped to lowest level since 2010. The median price of an existing home sold in September was 404,000, an increase at 3% year over year. Inventory rose 1.5%, uh, month on month to 1.39 million homes. Here's a deal, okay? Like the 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 home market's going to continue to be stale. You know, we need we need prices to come down. There's no there's no other way around it. The only way you can bring the housing market back is we have to have prices drop. And as somebody that owns three real estate properties, you know, if anything, you should say I should hope the the prices don't drop, right? At the end of the day, we need prices to drop. If we're going to get this real estate market moving, if we're going to get people moving, we need prices to come down 
and we need mortgage rates to come down. We'll speak about mortgage rates a little later on because we've got a video to react to at the very end around mortgage rates. But prices, I, I mean, you know, the two main markets I know very, very well are, are you know, the Phoenix metropolitan area, right, and, and all the surrounding areas around Phoenix, Arizona, and then Las Vegas and Henderson, North Las Vegas, everything like that. Those two markets I know inside and out. I know what homes should likely be going for. I know what build cost is, land acquisition is, like I know all those sorts of things, right? And I can just tell you like we're we're too high in Vegas for our pricing. We need to come down, I would say at least 10, 20% on pricing to really get this home market moving. Same thing in Arizona. Arizona needs a 15 to 25% uh, adjustment in pricing to really get the market actually moving where people are actually like, okay, you know, homes are actually a fair value. That doesn't mean they're like a steel deal. If, if home values drop 15% in Vegas, 15% in Phoenix Metro, that doesn't mean they're like, oh my gosh, this is like the greatest deal ever. No, that's just like, okay, at least we can start wrapping our heads around this. And until you get that, and you know, compounded with mortgage rates coming down, you're going to have a frozen home market. You're going to have a frozen home market. So, you know, the, the hope should be the prices get more realistic and then we can actually get people moving, which is great for the economy. Like if people move, like it's a great thing for the economy. A lot of people buy new stuff when they move, right? New furniture, new appliances. Uh, they might have to do work on the, the existing home they're, they're selling, right? Like it's, a, it's a phenomenal thing for the economy when the real estate market's moving and people are moving around. It's not good when people aren't moving, right? So the moral of the story is pricing has to come down. The home builders have to bring their prices down as well. The whole market has to readjust here if they want to to actually get things moving, right? And the only way I can really see that happening, we gotta get mainstream media to start covering this, right? So my, do I wanna go there? Okay, my thought is Trump wins the election, uh, media starts, you know, mainstream media starts really down talking the economy, right? And when mainstream media starts really down talking the economy, uh, that could get a lot of folks into much more, uh, let's call it, realistic thinking process in regards to selling their homes. And so instead of putting them at these ridiculous list prices and the homes sit month after month, year after year, I've seen a lot of homes now on the market in Phoenix and here in Vegas that have been on the market for six months, 12 months plus now. It's ridiculous because they're at these ridiculous prices that it's not, it's not realistic. And they start bringing down price and it's like, dude, you're so far off of the realistic price that you're still not selling at that price. So my thought is Trump wins the election. Uh, mainstream media starts talking about, oh, the economy is really bad. Real estate market's really bad. It's bad, bad, bad. And you just start seeing this out there and, and everybody starts thinking, oh yeah, you know, things are bad. I got to get more realistic about pricing. I got to bring down my price if I want to move my property. That's my thought. Mainstream media seems really, you know, obviously, uh, like they don't want to, to mention that before the election, obviously. But once the election gets done, if Trump wins, I think they'll start talking negative. And then that can get people into a more realistic thought process about how they're going to price their homes, which is going to be a great thing. Like, we need home prices to come down. Like, this, this, this is stupid. It's just stupid. People let their homes were listed as stupid prices. And that's why they're not moving. And that's in a lot of these big cities. It's not like it's only Vegas, it's Phoenix. No, it's a lot of the major markets. Prices have to come down at least 10% plus from here to get this market moving. And then if you can get mortgage rates on top, that's a cherry on top. And that's, that's the best thing, okay? Goldman sees S&P returning 3% over the next 10 years on average. Ooh. Controversial, David. <laughs> and so I am very curious about kind of what the caveat is here. Is there kind of any upside that could be squeezed out of the equity market that is um, outside of this base case? So let's talk about the base case for the next year. And then we'll look at the base case for the following uh, nine years for full year uh, decade of, of performance. So the next year, we're looking at the S&P 500 rising around 8%, 9% total return to an index level of around 6,300. And the thought process behind that is the U.S. Uh, economy is growing, uh, inflation is coming down, the Fed is cutting rates, earnings are growing 11% in calendar 2025 and another 7% in calendar 2026. And that sets up with the uh, valuation today of around 22 times earnings, slight compression in the multiple. That is the building blocks to a return in the next 12 months of roughly 9%. So what we focused on in this report was... Hey, PayPal. Uh, man, I lost my thought process there. 
the base case for the next year, and then we'll look at the base case for the following uh, nine years for full year uh, decade of, of performance. So the next year, we're looking at the S&P 500 rising around 8%, 9% total return to an index level of around 6,300. And the thought process behind that is the U.S. Uh, economy is growing, uh, inflation's coming down, the Fed is cutting rates, earnings are growing 11% in calendar 2025 and another 7% in calendar 2026. And that sets up with the uh, valuation today of around 22 times earnings, slight compression in the multiple. That is the building blocks to a return in the next 12 months of roughly 9%. So what we focused on in this report was what's the probable total return that an investor should anticipate for the cap weighted S&P 500 index. And the conclusion was a range of somewhere between negative 1% and positive 7%. Midpoint of that is around 3%. What is the driving force behind that uh, thought process and that analytics? Well, there are two issues. The first is valuation. We know when the market trades at a high multiple, a high valuation, that the next 10 years is typically low relative to an environment where, say, the multiple was low at the beginning, you tend to get a pretty strong return in the subsequent, uh, the subsequent decade. So we're sitting here with a cyclically adjusted PE multiple that's different from a forward one-year multiple, but they, they, based on the cyclical uh, adjusted earnings for the last decade of 38 times. That's the 97th percentile versus, say, the last 100 years. So it's mm. a very, very start, expensive starting point. And what's new about the analysis is that we also include a variable for concentration. We're in one of the most, the highest concentration markets in 100 years. Top 10 stocks, for example, comprise around 36% of the index. It's an extremely narrow concentration. And historically, when you have a high concentration market, you have a relatively muted return in the subsequent 10 years. Now, valuation and concentration are two different variables. They're not correlated. So there's two different influences as to why we get a lower, uh, relatively modest return. Yep. Now, what are the implications for a portfolio manager? Matt, the Wait, way hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, let me show you something very important here. All right, this is extremely important what I'm showing you here right now. If you want to think about long-term returns for the overall market, you've got to think about the top stocks, right? Because the top stocks are really what drive the market. Think about the companies that are trillion dollars or more than a trillion dollars, multi-trillion dollars, and there's going to be a lot more trillion dollar and multi-trillion dollar companies in the future, right? The thing you got to keep in mind is we're in a very different dynamic over the past, I would say, 15, 20 years because of the internet age and technology in general and how fast things are moving, where companies' margin profiles are getting to such a different scale than we've ever seen throughout history, right? And to, to illustrate this example, I want to show you what the giants of the market used to be. Because prior to tech taking over and becoming the biggest market caps in the, in, in the stock market and the ones that run the stock market, prior to that, the biggest stocks in the market were many times companies like ExxonMobil, right? ExxonMobil, 10% net income margin, 28% gross margin, compared to Meta's at 81% gross margin and 34% net margin, compared to NVIDIA, which is 75% gross margin and 55% net margin. It's ridiculous. The, mar the oil and gas stocks, they were, they were the, the giants of the market, right? If we look at a company like Chevron, Chevron, net margins, 9%. Versus 34 and 55. Gross margins of 37 versus 81 and 75. Who else used to be the big giants in the market? Well, it was companies like Johnson & Johnson and Procter & Gamble, right? We pull up Johnson & Johnson, 69% gross margin. That's phenomenal, right? About a 12% net margin versus Meta's at a 34% and NVIDIA's at a 55%. Let's go ahead and check out PG, Procter & Gamble. Look at this. 50% gross margin versus 81 and 75, net margin of 15% versus 34 and 55. Let's check out another giant, Coca-Cola. You always think of Coca-Cola as a super high margin company, right? Generally speaking, it's very high margin, 61%, but that doesn't compare to Meta's 81% or NVIDIA's 75%. That certainly doesn't compare to the, look at the net margin. Net margin Coca-Cola is phenomenal, 19%. It's a long way from 34 and 55%, right? And so the important thing to understand is it's really hard to forecast where the market's going to be long-term because the biggest companies 
are so much more profitable than anything we've seen in any past decades. You've never seen this sort of, of margin profiles of companies, gross margins and, and net margins. Never mind, we're going into an age of AI over this next 10 plus years, right? And what is AI going to do for companies? My guess is it's going to make them immensely more profitable. So it might become very commonplace for these top tier companies to have margin profiles, net margin profiles of 40-ish percent. 40-ish percent, folks. We've never seen that. Like net margins usually were good around 5-10%. Now we're talking about a whole different scale of profitability. Additionally, we're talking about companies that can do business globally easier than ever before, especially in the tech space in, in relation, right? I mean, you look at Meta, they're doing business all over the globe outside of maybe like China, right? China's the one big market that Meta's really missing out on, but Meta's just about everywhere else you wanna be with Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, it's incredible. If you think about Apple, they're selling iPhones all over the world, right? If you think about Google's properties, they're all over the world outside of maybe China, right? And so you just run through these companies and Nvidia's selling chips everywhere other than maybe China, right? And so it's just incredible. And Nvidia is still selling some chips to, to China. They just can't sell some of their most advanced chips to China. So companies are more global than ever, which means their business opportunity is bigger than ever, and their margin profiles are substantially bigger than, than we've ever seen in history. So to make a judgment on where the market's going to be 10 years from now, it's very difficult. It's very possible that his scenario plays out here, but how I think his scenario would play out is I would look at it from 2021 peak at the end of 2021 to 2031. And how I would think about it is imagine we have a major crash in the market in the next few years. Let's say in the next three years at some point. We get one of those S&P 500 down like 30 plus percent, right? The big one. The big unemployment cycle hits, blah, 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 okay? We could get that easily in the next three years. So then after you get that crash, then you got to get the climb back out of that crash. And that's how you could get to more dismal returns if you compare it from the 2021 peak in November to let's say 20. 2030 or 2031, something like that. Okay, so that's how you get the kind of lower return profile. And that's, I think, is a realistic possibility. We saw that in, in uh, the 2000 to 2010 timeframe, right? Or you could say 2000 to 2009. 2000 valuations were at extremes. We had the tech bubble, right? Then there was kind of that crash coming off of that was kind of similar to what we had in 2022. And then we had the great financial crisis that hit, obviously, in 07, 09. And so, you know, the market was obviously in a pretty bad place by the end of 09. And so that led us to basically a lost decade there. That could easily be what happens 2030 or 2021 to 2031, where it's just like returns are very limited, right? And it's kind of seen as almost like a lost decade because you get a crash in there at some point in time, like a major crash. So... That's, that's a potential, right? Definitely a potential. But you got to keep in mind what I just explained there. Don't get too bearish on the market over the long term, I can tell you that much. The thing about this is equal weighted. The equal weighted return is likely to be probably 500 basis points greater. So instead of 3% for an aggregate index, something like 8% for the typical equal weighted index. And so that's the conclusion well, of the report. Well, but the, um, the concentration is in... I think very many global champions, right? I mean, you have companies that dominate their spaces globally. Um, plus, we've got a few that are likely to come on board soon. Uh, SpaceX, um, for example, OpenAI uh, may go public in the next decade. And if I look, David, over the last decade, I actually stole this chart from DataTrek, as I've pointed out before, but the only time that we've had um, 3% returns has been when we've had ca catastrophic events, the Great Depression, the oil shock, the financial crisis. Do you expect something like that to come again over the next decade? No, what we're anticipating is a broadening of the market, the relative performance of the typical stock versus the aggregate index. What we're focusing on is a strategy for how to perform well. When we deal with some of our largest institutional clients, Sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, endowments, insurance companies, family offices. When they think about a 10-year horizon, they think about asset allocation, where are the risks? And the idea of a very concentrated market 
is what tends to be a risk that gets introduced, and that is the emphasis of this report, and that's the, the, the thought process, that's the analytics behind it and the model that we build. We look at rates, we look at the economic environment, we look at the profitability and the ROE of companies. And so all of these variables at the index level relative to the typical stock, that's how we get to a conclusion, that it's a better strategy, a better return strategy from our perspective uh, right. with a equal weighted strategy. Well, David, I want to talk about the cross-asset nature of this call, too, because you say that it's like... You don't understand Goldman Sachs' client base is uh, high net worth, extreme high net worth, right? And so they're not just going to be looking for, tell me the SP500 is going to go up a bunch and let me buy, right? They're looking for a more complex strategy. they got to feel like they're getting their money's worth. That's a big thing. they got to feel like, oh, these guys are really smart. They know what they're doing. And uh, we got to get our money's worth out of these guys, right? So to just come back and say, just buy the S&P 500 is definitely not good enough uh, for, those, for, for a Goldman Sachs client, right? You need to be definitely more sophisticated than that. And so that they derive these kind of more advanced plans and do this, do that. You know, just keep that in mind. That bonds are going to outperform in this environment. But reading through this call, I mean, if you're not calling for a recession here, I assume the Fed doesn't cut rates back to zero. Wouldn't this be a call for cash? Aren't cash yields going to say relatively high and you don't have any credit or duration risk there? Well, I mean, there's other strategies. You could look at private credit. You could look at uh, private equity as a potential uh, way of diversifying a portfolio. Relative to right now, uh, the idea of treasuries, uh, 10-year treasuries yielding 4.2%. Uh, so if you were to start today and look out with our you know, centerpiece of our, or the central case of our uh, forecast, something like 3%. But if you look at the distribution, look, the idea of being at the high end, there are a lot of reasons why you could be at the higher end of our range, closer to uh, 7%. Matt identified a couple of those. You, know, you typically get around 3.5% uh, of the constituents in the S&P 500 turnover every year. So we look out uh, for a decade, you're probably looking at a third of the index. There's going to be new stocks that don't exist today in the index. Uh, so there's certainly a lot of variables that could happen. The economy could be growing more rapidly, more slowly than, we, you know, than a baseline forecast. Uh, those are those are their issues. AI in terms of artificial mm -hmm. intelligence could raise productivity. I mean, lots of reasons why it could be better than our base case scenario, uh, which is why we have a range uh, to the uh, to, to the upside and the downside. You know, one thing that struck me in this note as well is a one third chance that you have the S and P five hundred lagging inflation through twenty thirty four. What's the role of inflation here, and and what is the risk? that it could be higher? What if the neutral rate is higher? What kind of impact would that have on equity market returns? Well, if you think about inflation right now, the, the tips break-evens are around 2.2%, for example. And so based on a scenario where you have uh, a return that could be negative 1% annualized versus positive 7%, kind of there's a distribution around that, relatively normal uh, type distribution, the you know, part tail of the, of the distribution would give you a, a, a prospect of a return that's less than inflation. That's not the base case, but it certainly is a, is a, is a scenario. You know, when dealing with portfolio managers, they want to think about what are the risks that are introduced into their portfolio. And the argument behind a broadening of the market is an important construct. So one of the arguments on why mid-cap stocks are likely to do better than, uh, in, than the rest of the market in the coming year. They have the best torque to the idea of the Fed cutting rates. They've got 25% of their balance sheet is floating rate. So you have uh, the Fed cut rates. They have less interest expense. They have higher uh, earnings, positive earnings revisions, drives equity prices. And so right. those are you know, tactical issues, opportunities in the market. So we think about tactics. We think about strategy longer term. And that's the uh, purpose of writing the report in, in response to questions from clients about how should we think about the prospective 10-year forward returns in, uh, in the equities. Right. David, we don't have a lot of time left. I know I have a question. I know that Matt has a question as well. So let me ask you this quickly. I want to get existential about the business that you're in because you think back to January and actually Wall Street strategists on average were expecting the S&P 500 to rise about 2% this year. It's up 23%. And I'll flip the question to you. Is it getting harder to model, to forecast where the index is going hmm. to go? Well, it is challenging because a third of the index is comprised right now of about 10 stocks. Uh, that's not just tech stocks. You have some yeah. uh, healthcare stocks, uh, Eli Lilly. You've got uh, Berkshire Hathaway's in the top 10 companies, for example. Depends on the day we're, uh, we're looking at it. It could be Visa, uh, Broadcom, different, you know, different constituents, along with the big tech companies that we're all familiar with. And so it's challenging to look at the 
market that's that component, and you can look at the rest of the, uh, the, the balance of the market. So you think about those big stocks. They trade at 31 times earnings. That's a 2.7% or so uh, earnings yield. It's a negative risk premium versus 10-year treasuries. So that's a concern about valuation. And then you have the concentration uh, item that I overlaid. The rest of the market has a positive risk premium versus bonds, and so that's one of the attractive components of why there's a broadening of the market and why we anticipate that to persist. David, I have a, uh, an election night question for you. When you, you know, get home, put on your slippers, grab a scotch and your pipe um, or whatever, and you, you settle down in that lazy boy, right? Click on Bloomberg TV. What are the... Um, what are the indexes or the assets or what are you going to be watching on election night as we hopefully get a clearer picture of who's going to occupy the White House in the next four years? Well, the election is obviously quite close in terms of the polls and things like that. So I think there's a, a couple of things that we look at. Uh, first, is there a split Congress versus the presidency? That would suggest there's certain executive uh, actions that can be taken, whether that's respect to tariffs, whether it's uh, respect to uh, certain regulation aspects that, uh, that the presidency, he or she, could, uh, could, could uh, implement. Whereas if there's a sweep on the Democrat or the Republican side, either direction, uh, there are potential legislative uh, aspects. So, Matt, that's sort of the first question I want to think about. Uh, the second is we think about, well, what are the impacts of potential tariffs? What would they be? Well, U.S. companies that are selling domestically uh, are likely to outperform U.S. companies that export more to uh, the rest of the world because there could be retaliatory tariffs. So that's one strategy that we might, uh, may, might look at. We might look at uh, companies that have uh, that sort of uh, executive authority that you might want to think about. And then we, we talk about that with, with portfolio managers. And there's right. uh, baskets that we have. We trade on Bloomberg with clients uh, based on those two characteristics. Yeah, I was just taking a peek at Berkshire Hathaway while he was speaking there, right? And uh, Berkshire Hathaway, by the way, another one of those big dog companies, been a big dog for a long time. Look at the net income margins on that, around 17% versus many of these tech companies are now 30% plus, right? Whole, that's why the market's really changed forever. <laughs> because of these companies are just like these things we've never seen before. But uh, the moral of the story is I was looking at Berkshire Hathaway here and I was actually running some modest numbers for Berkshire of like 7% re revenue growth, 8% net income growth per year, right? Uh, 20 to 30 PE ratio somewhere in there and actually has a pretty attractive return profile, which I think is very interesting. And you can say, well, Berkshire Hathaway has so much cash, then maybe they deserve more than a 20 uh, P on the low end because one they have such a s massive amount of stable business models right but additionally they have so much cash so much money that it actually de-risks a company significantly versus an average company so if you ran let's say we we went with maybe let's let's go with like a 25 P for the low range right because let's just say Berkshire deserves a little more respect. Then you can get a compound annual growth rate on the low end of 22%, 27% on the high end. Let's take it even more modest, though. Let's go with 5% revenue growth per year, and let's go with just 6% EPS growth. So even, let's, we'll take it down even more modest here. And we're still at 20% and 25%. Let's take it even more modest, then. Let's take it down to, let's take it down to 3%. <laughs> It'd be really bad for Berkshire to have only 3% revenue growth, but I just want to take it down even more. Let's take it down to 4% EPS growth. Dang. 17, 23? Berkshire's actually, actually a good value. I got to say, Warren Buffett's company here is a good value. That's interesting. When you take the numbers down that far, whew. It's impressive. Now, we do have to remember their biggest investment by far is still Apple, right? So we are riding a little bit on what happens with Apple Pro, you know, if the stock goes beast over the next few years. Let's say the iPhone 17 is finally a banger. And finally, I have a banger iPhone for the first time in like 100 years, right? Let's say that happens. Consumer's in a better spot. Okay, all of a sudden Apple's revenues are rolling, right? Because we know the services revenue is going to keep pouring in. And all of a sudden Apple gets to be a much more exciting story. So I don't know but they got a lot of cash around. If the market downtrends in a significant way, man, is Berkshire in a position where they could buy, buy, buy. <sighs> hmm, Berkshire Hathaway, decently attractive, I gotta say. 
I'm going to have to put more thought into this one. Investment management chief market strategist, Drew Mattis. So only one more. Market still is at two more. Only one more. The market got ahead of itself with the September cut, and I think you're seeing the, the market response to that actually is one of the reasons why the 10-year yield is behaving the way it is. Um, and I think, higher. yeah, the 10-year yields have moved higher on that. Gold has actually moved significantly higher relative to equities, which is a nice little, um, I like to think of that as a Fed credibility measure. Do you want to have a real asset or a financial asset? If you can count on the Fed to contain inflation, you want to, you want to have a financial asset. If you can't, then you want to have the real asset. And I think the trend we've been seeing in that relationship is suggestive that the, people think maybe the Fed got a little ahead of themselves. Wait, you think the reason gold is rising is because people don't think the Fed can control inflation? I think they think that 50 was a mistake and that it put in market expectations for a significant amount of more easing that are unlikely to be fulfilled. Ooh. Right, but ultimately, doesn't it just matter if inflation flares back up? That would be the mistake. Do you see that happening? That would be the mistake, but if you, if you look at a five-year, five-year inflation break-even, so inflation from year six through ten, what we're actually have seen in the last month is that's up about 10 basis points. So about a quarter of the move you've seen in Treasury yields can be attributed to long-term inflation expectations rising. Because the Fed's effort to fight inflation fails. I think because the Fed has given up in fighting inflation, they switched to a growth story. That was the September 50 basis point ease. Um, and now people are still expecting them to continue to be very aggressive, yet the other markets are telling you that maybe it's not the best idea to be aggressive uh, right now. It kind of fits with what Paul Tudor Jones said yesterday, and that is try to keep inflation on the high end of the range, grow and inflate your way out of what is a difficult debt and debt. So only expecting one more rate cut this year. Yep, I agree with that. 25 basis point, one more cut, and then they're going to be done. Forecasting increased economic and market volatility. Um, That could be. That could be. Uh, thinks real assets will continue to outperform. Interesting. Situation, yeah. Certainly, and, you know, I think if you're the Fed, that's probably not the worst idea, particularly, you know, we have a very positive view on productivity over the next five to ten years. Uh, you know, everything, all the investments that were made during COVID, all the investments that have been made since. To kind By the of way, even though I think they're going to cut 25 this next one, I actually do believe they should cut. Like, if, if I was choosing, I'd cut 50 again. Uh, then I want to see how holiday sales are looking and then potentially, um, you know, go with either 25 or 50 come, you know, Q1 of 2025. So, you know, I, uh, you got to skate to where the puck is going. And the moral of the story is we got, we got too much weakness out there to be at this sort of Fed funds rate with the CPI that's on its way to be being under 2% here soon. Technology uh, progress we've seen across a different number of categories, biotech, space, etc. Uh, they're all going to start interacting. And when that happens, it'll, I think it's going to look a lot like the 1990s from a growth perspective where you have very high trend growth in the United States, high nominal growth with kind of more moderate inflation perhaps. Um, and you should be able to grow your way out of some of the deficit story if you contain the deficit at you know levels that are kind of a little below where they are now. So you know, in order to get that deficit down, you don't have to kill yourself, but you do have to make sure that you, you stop digging the hole that you're putting yourself in. Can I just ask? Speaking of fifty, Canada goes fifty today, four straight. Is there is there is there oddness in the asymmetry between what's happening a few miles away? I mean, I, I think the U.S. has had a little more forward momentum uh, than they've had, so we maybe need a little less help. You know, there are signs of concern in the U.S. market. So I mean, I, I, for me, housing and, and kind of the dysfunction within the housing market is a significant one. Yeah. Um, you know, rates had came down kind of up until recently, and yet we saw home prices actually begin to decelerate, home price appreciation deceleration, not really what should be happening when rates are moving lower in the housing market. Right. I mean, housing's funky because there's a supply shortage, right? And now buyers are coming back online, so I guess... There's not a supply shortage. Oh, that's such a freaking BS thing. They keep talking about there's housing shortage, there's housing shortage. There's not a housing shortage. I'm here to tell everybody there's no fucking housing shortage, okay? Everybody's going to see real soon there's no housing shortage. There's no dang housing shortage. The amount of homes, apartments, everything that's been built over the past 10 years is astronomically high. It's ridiculous, specifically on like multifamily. I'm talking like apartment complexes and things like that. The amount of those that's been built over this last 10 years in every major city is like numbers you've never seen before. It's ridiculous. There's no housing shortage. There was 
because the economy got so hot, it led people to believe there's a housing shortage because when the economy is very hot, everybody's feeling great. They go buy extra homes. They go buy real estate investment properties, right? Um, you know, people move out of their parents' home and this and that. And it's just like, boom, boom, boom. And then all of a sudden the economy gets like people were convinced there was a house before the great financial crisis hit. People also thought there was a housing shortage. There was a housing shortage prior to the great financial crisis. And then what did we find just a few years later? There's a housing surplus. We don't know what to do with all the homes. My city I live in nowadays, Vegas, they didn't know what to do with all the homes. There were so many foreclosed homes. They're like, like, like they, they, they had all these like plans they had to implement and whatnot because there's too many damn homes everywhere. Everybody's like, there's too many homes. The home builders like almost stopped building. It was like their numbers went down so significantly. It was ridiculous. The home builder stocks fell 70, 80% plus. Right in the city I was living in back in those days when I was like 18 years old, it was uh, Phoenix. Right, we had too many damn homes. They were everywhere. There were short sales everywhere, foreclosures everywhere. Apartment complexes were desperate. Even apartment complexes were still desperate when I moved out of my parents' home in 2011. In 2011, I got a $750 uh, payment on that apartment complex, full in. Right, and I think that included water and trash as well. And that was a beautiful one bedroom apartment in a great area, beautiful countertops, the whole thing, super modern, had laundry right inside my own apartment. Like it was gorgeous, beautiful pool, gym, all that stuff, right? $750 a month. And if I recall, they paid my first month and my last month, right? Which was a whole, but why were they doing that? Because there was no housing shortage. There was too many damn places to live. And that's what people start to realize if all of a sudden the economy gets shaken. If all of a sudden you start to up un unemployment, what happens? People start moving in with each other. Family members start moving in with each other. Friends start becoming roommates. And all of a sudden you realize, whoo, whoa, we didn't need all those homes. The real estate investors go belly up that are too highly leveraged. The guy that owns eight properties that got way over leveraged all of a sudden has to sell all his properties, has to liquidate them all because he can't find tenants at attractive pricing. He paid me way too much for the properties. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, there was no housing shortage. There was actually too much damn housing. That's what you find out over time. And that's, you know, we'll see. We'll see. But uh, I can tell you, if the, the economy goes uh, a negative way, <laughs> people will be talking about, it's going to be so funny looking back at this. Oh, God. Pressure on prices. And people don't want to cut their prices because it's like my neighbor got this. Why would I possibly cut my price? Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of stalled. Uh, but when, it, when that stall gets restarted you know when the desperation comes that's when people start lowering price like crazy like i've got to move i've got to move this house and drop it to whatever price we can freaking sell this thing when that happens boom the game changes immediately and the more people you have like that those are the people that actually reset the housing market so unfortunately it comes from the desperation the people that the over leveraged real estate investor they can't find tenants all of a sudden. And he's like, crap, man. I just moved this damn property. I need to get rid of it. All of a sudden, people start foreclosing, short sales, all that crap. Then all of a sudden, that's what drops the market down. And everybody starts getting really real, really fast around their pricing. And the person that's not that desperate, that needs to move, all of a sudden starts to realize, crap, like I can either price this at some ridiculous price or I can price it at something that will move, right? And then all of a sudden, you start actually having movement in the housing market again. There's a potential for home prices to actually behave in a way that we shouldn't expect, which would be a decline in home prices. Mm -hmm. And that's going to get all those homeowners feeling a little more or a little less positive on the economy. So if I'm taking your sort of worldview into account and what it means for the markets, I, I feel like it's it's what we've seen. It's equity friendly, not so much for bonds, though. It's equity true? friendly. I think, you know, to the extent that inflation is going to be higher for a sustained period of time, it helps to explain credit spreads because inflation is a credit positive event because these companies borrow in nominal terms. Um, and that means, you know, maybe it helps to explain even things like high yield spreads. Mm. I, I can't get over the, the whole housing shortage thing they keep talking about. Cracks me up. Mortgage rates that we've seen lately is the equivalent of a 6% increase in a home's price from a monthly payment perspective. Let's bring in Alan Ratner with Zellman and Associates. It's a Walker and Dunlop company. Alan, welcome. So, I mean, this really, this has an impact. So funny. 
Yeah. Hey, Kelly, thanks for having me. Um, no question it has an impact. You know, there's a lot of noise in the housing market right now. Um, Diana mentioned the election, higher rates, et cetera. But at the end of the day, you know, this is a market where affordability it remains incredibly stretched. There was a lot of optimism this time a month ago that rates would be you know, continuing on a downward trajectory, maybe even dip into the fives. And of course, we've seen a reversal there. So it's important to keep in mind what impact that does have on the consumer. And every 25 basis point increase in mortgage rates is the equivalent of a 3% increase in home prices from a monthly payment standpoint. So this is really pinching the, the consumer's wallet. Yeah. Where does, what does it mean for the housing market overall? Well, I think from the housing market perspective, we continue to see a slow grind higher over the next several years. Um, you know, rates obviously off of the bottom here, but still down year over year. We're still seeing a solid economy. And I think from a very high level, more inventory, as long as it's not distressed, is a good thing to kind of get the, the wheels back moving again in the housing market because the resale market has really been uh, constrained by a lack of inventory. The new home market, on the other hand, you know, we're continuing to see solid activity there. The builders have a real competitive advantage. They're able to buy down mortgage rates so they can solve at least a portion of that affordability issue for the, the, the buyer. And they've taken a good amount of share from the tight resale market. And in that case, where does that leave the home builders? Well, I think right now, from a home building perspective, we, we continue to see mid single digit volume growth um, where the stocks have been under some pressure recently down about 10 percent from the highs. I think is more um, around concerns about gross margin and what impact those mortgage rate buy downs are going to have on margin. So there's demand for homes and, and they're selling homes. The question is, at what price and margin? And right now, just given where affordability is, we just don't see a lot of opportunity to raise prices or lower incentives to drive that margin back up. I can't wait for these home builders to get hit. I can't freaking wait. Some of you guys, you probably haven't dealt with home builders because you probably haven't built the house in like the last few years and whatnot. But I can tell you they're so freaking cocky. It's ridiculous. The the moves they're making is so greedy. And, and respect is business, man. It's business. Be greedy. Like do your thing. But I can't wait. I can't wait for the day of reckoning on those freaking home builders, man. The, the games they've been playing over the last several years, it's ridiculous. Making people bid against each other just to get a lot. Like, oh my God. Like, there's just so many games they've been playing with consumers because they've been in such an insane, um, you know, position of power. They were in a huge position of power for many years, right? Uh, but that's going to go away. And it's going to go away very soon here. And so it's going to be interesting to see that. But man... You know, they're, they're, all their businesses have been pretty much at all-time highs. You know, revenues, profitability, margins, all those sorts of things. And they've been able to just have their way with the home buyers because they've been in just a, such a position of power. But, you know, these things don't last forever. They cycle around, and the next thing you know, all of a sudden they're going to be desperate, wishing they had customers. That's going to be interesting. Although that's what we're hearing from some of the builders that they're doing. Yeah. So I, again, I think a month or two ago, there was a lot of optimism in the industry that this time, um, that, you know, I'm sitting here mid-October post the Fed rate cut, that they would be able to dial back those incentives. They would be able to stabilize oh, no. margin. They're about to go. And that really hasn't happened. We've heard from a number of companies over the last several weeks, and now earnings season's kicking into high gear. That incentives remain very competitive. Uh, rate oh. buy-downs remain very prevalent in them. And it hasn't even started. It hasn't even started to get really incentive heavy. Just wait. And that's putting a bit of a downward pressure on gross margin. All right. Alan, thanks so much for joining us. So we appreciate checking in with you today. Before you know it, they're gonna be they're gonna be discounting land, they're gonna be discounting the homes, they're gonna be giving crazy amounts of, of uh, you know potential options in the homes. Ooh, you just wait. Especially once all of a sudden the, the existing home market, the inventory starts to pile up even further than it's already piling up. And then you start getting some folks that are desperate um, and they start moving prices down in a lot of markets. Oh, man. Wait to see how – like like I still wouldn't even consider buying a new home from a home builder right now. Oh, no, 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 no. A year from now, it might be a very, very – very different story in regards to that. So that shall be interesting, okay? All right, guys, appreciate you joining me as always. Fun times. It's an interesting market. We got drama, drama, drama. If you want my free workshop, Stocks to Buy Now for 2025, check out the pinned comment down there and click on that. You can send it over via email or you can send it over via text. However you want to receive that workshop should help you out there. Much love and have a great day.